So this next group uh, had to really work under duress because I was their faculty advisor. They also had an issue that wasn't about whales or bees or things like that. They're trying to actually save the city you're living in. Um, and so that created a different set of scientific issues, uh, most of which we couldn't touch on, which would, which would have been social psychology uh, and the weirdness of New Yorkers, um, which I'm very familiar with. So let's, let's hear about uh, the creation of the Department of Sustainability in New York. Good morning, everyone. I'm Navodata Singh. And today I'll be briefing you on the bill that proposes the creation of the Department of Sustainability and Climate Change in New York City. I'd like to thank our faculty advisor, Dr. Stephen Cohen, and the rest of my team, headed by manager Janisha Shrestha and deputy manager Elena Belletti. Between an introduction and conclusion today, I'm going to walk you through the environmental problems that we're addressing, our approach to the solutions, the solutions themselves, as well as the indicators to measure their success. So what is the proposed bill? This bill is primarily an organizational bill, which seeks to repeal the existing Office of Sustainability from under the mayor's office and create a separate Department of Sustainability and Climate Change in New York City. It also seeks to merge and subsume some of the functions of the Office of Resiliency and the Office of Environmental Coordination under this department. In doing so, it seeks to potentially create a better funded department that will look at all aspects of critical infrastructure resiliency, coastal protection, citywide sustainability, as well as climate change. So while we'll focus on the management and economics related to this action in the next semester, for the purpose of this semester, we decided to focus on climate change adaptation, which is a unique and defining function of this department, and also because of the imminent threats that climate change poses to New York City. This also gives us an opportunity to measure success at a citywide scale. Now, human beings and their activities are leading to an amplification of global temperature rise. We call this climate change, and it can have severe impacts on the planet's long-term weather systems and stability. New York City as a coastal metropolis with over 500 miles of coastline 27,000 people per square mile, an extremely built infrastructure is really at the forefront of facing climate change impacts such as rising temperature, rising sea levels, and increased precipitation. By the 2050s, New York City is expected to be hotter than ever before. Average temperatures are expected to rise by up to 6 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures can rise due to greenhouse gas effect, heat waves, but in an urban context like New York City, they can also rise due to the urban heat island effect. A third of the temperature rise in the city can be attributed to this effect. And this is mostly due to the presence of darker colored media, such as metals and concretes. The intensive and built infrastructure prevents heat from dissipating and keeps temperatures high, even during the night. The New York City Panel on Climate Change reports that sea level rise in New York City is higher than the global average. This is because the land is subsiding and because regional ocean waters are, are warming up and expanding. You can expect a rise of up to 30 inches by the 2050s. This, combined with increased precipitation by up to over 10% by the 2050s, will lead to severe consequences such as coastal and inland flooding and storm surges. The map here presents progression of high impact, low probability floodings by the end of the century. So why is this a problem? Deaths related to heat can rise by up to 30 times the present day in the next 50 to 60 years. Diseases which have never prevailed in this region before can move increasingly polewards. And an increasing energy bill will strain a system that also supports the storage of food and medicine stocks. Rising sea level and precipitation will render more spaces uninhabitable and lead to coastal erosion. They will also lead to breakdown of critical infrastructure that supports some of the most basic amenities, such as food, water, transport, and sanitation. Given the gravity of the situation, we propose climate change adaptation solutions. We look at mostly two categories of solutions, gray and green, where gray 
is, is likely inspired by the grayness of materials that are used in more conventional and industrial technologies. And green can manifest itself in biomorphism, which means integrating natural ecosystems with built infrastructure, and also biomimicry, which seeks to take inspiration from nature to, to build technologies that are more resilient in nature. We look at one solution under each category for the three problems that we've identified, and I'll take you through each of these solutions one by one. In response to heat, one option is to retrofit buildings with either white roofs or green roofs. Painting the roofs white works by reflecting most of the solar radiation received and cooling indoor temperatures. However, it is, there is some uncertainty around what this does to regional temperatures. Green roofs, on the other hand, entail adding a vegetative layer on top of buildings. And in addition to reducing indoor temperatures, this also promotes coastal biodiversity and reduces stormwater runoff. However, it adds to the, the structural load of a building, and this can be problematic. In response to rising sea levels, we looked at seawalls. Seawalls are any hard-surfaced wall which prevents waves from reaching further inland. The vertical surface dissipates the wave energy downwards and sideways. But in the process, this could lead to coastal erosion and loss of coastal biodiversity. Living shorelines, on the other hand, are basically salt marshes or mangroves, which are installed on the shore and are supposed to absorb shock of the waves and the force of the waves during storm surges and hurricanes. However, the intensity or their capacity to withstand these shocks is still uncertain. In response to rising precipitation, we looked at combined sewer systems in New York City. However, due to lack of capacity during high precipitation events, this leads to an overflow of an untreated mixture of sewage as well as storm water runoff into water bodies. The negative impacts that this has on environmental health as well as sanitation calls for potentially expanding the capacity of these systems. Bioswales or rain gardens on the other hand, which some of you might have noticed on the roadsides and pavements in New York City, basically absorb water during excess precipitation events. And not only they, do they prevent uh, excess storm water from reaching sewer systems, they also filter out pollutants and debris. So now that we've gone over the solutions, let's look at some of the indicators to measure their success. To measure the effectiveness of white roofs or green roofs, we propose indicators that likely would capture a reduction in indoor and outdoor temperatures, a reduction in public health impacts, such as mortality or heat-related ailments, and a reduction in the per capita energy consumption. To measure the effectiveness of seawalls and living shorelines, we propose indicators that capture a reduction in wave intensity within protected areas, as well as a reduction in coastal erosion. To measure the effectiveness of sewer expansion and bioswales, we looked at indicators that will capture reduction in combined sewer overflow events and an improvement in water quality. The bill requires a sustainability plan to be set up for the next 30 years with both short-term and long-term indicators, and we feel that these indicators could easily be incorporated in such a framework. And it's also beneficial to know that the bill, in doing so, recognizes the long-term and evolving nature of climate change. So to summarize, we went over reasons such as the extremely built and coastal nature of New York City that make it extremely vulnerable to climate change impacts. The creation of a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change that focuses specifically on climate change adaptation is quite opportune. A successful resiliency strategy would be one that provides co-beneficial outcomes, avoids negative indirect impacts on other systems, and we may benefit out of looking at integration of both green and gray solutions. I'll end with a picture that represents such an integration. Green and gray approaches together not just offer short-term and long-term benefits, but they also offer a measure of security through diversification of the solutions. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Questions? 
So would this um, department work in conjunction with other departments in New York City, like NYSERDA for energy? So because you're focusing on climate change? Yes, so uh, this department or this bill also has provisions to create a sustainability advisory board and interagency teams. And the purpose of that is to bring together expertise from different sectors uh, and also explore uh, innovation in technology. So yes, we would assume that they would be working with other departments as well. Great job. Um, in terms of protecting shorelines, historically uh, there's been a preference for the hard sort of approaches of using seawalls and bulkheads. Um, and I was just curious whether you have seen a shift, maybe an attitude that's shifting more towards the implementation of the living shoreline approach? That's an interesting question. Um, I would think that the way to approach this would be um, region specific. And uh, depending on the effectiveness of both, looking at the effectiveness of both uh, a hard surface and as well as shorelines, a conjunction may be better. Uh, there are some areas which are exploring uh, oyster breakwaters and shorelines to uh, sort of manage the effect and intensity of waves. So since all of this is fairly new, I would think how it responds to climate change would be measured by how it performs in the coming years. Thank you. Is there an estimate in how much citywide temperatures might decrease if most of the rooftop area was covered with green roofs? Mm -hmm. So there are estimates that if 50% of New York City was covered with green roofs, we might see temperatures uh, drop to maybe like a degree, one degree Celsius. Uh, however, in other areas, this temperature varies. So you might just see uh, temperatures going down by even four degrees, but I think this is region specific and still needs to be tested. <laughs> 